Hi, I'm Quinn and I'm Autistic. Welcome to Autistomatic. Over the past three weeks, I've been telling the stories of two undiagnosed autistic boys as they navigated their way through the school system up to age 13. You can catch up with their journey so far and understand some of the choices made in compiling the details of their lives in the link above and in the description. If you want to comment on this video, it would be a good idea for you to catch up with the story so far. Lenny and Tom are now 16 years old, a significant age for most of us, autistic or not. Standing on the cusp of adulthood, yet still children in law. This was in the early 90s, so the boys would now be free to smoke tobacco, join the armed forces, get married to a woman, and would no longer be legally obliged to attend full-time education. They would not yet be old enough to legally drive, to vote, have a boyfriend, or to drink alcohol. It's a complicated time in their lives, and a confusing one. They'll also soon be taking their GCSE exams roughly equivalent to graduating high school in the US. Tom's last few years have been more stable and fruitful than his time in primary school. A couple of years ago, Madame Frost, his French teacher, had offered him extra tuition in his lunch breaks. She realised now that she'd been wrong about him being dyslexic, and she'd grown to think of him as an eccentric child, full of talent yet held back by some unusual differences from his peers. She thought he'd been teasing her when he said he was distracted by the noise and smells of the other pupils, but she gradually learned that whilst his concerns seemed strange and unrelatable to her, they were very real to him. Between them, they'd found some ways to help him cope with the sensory distractions of the classroom. He would now smear Vicks Vapor Rub under his nose to help cover the biological smells of people around him, and wore discreet earplugs in class. They'd also worked out a series of visual signals that allowed Madame Frost to tell Tom that she'd select him next so he could prepare. It had done wonders in his French lessons, and he was now, without doubt, a first-class student. Once she'd secured his place in her class, she encouraged Tom to choose Spanish as an option too. His skill in languages shouldn't be wasted. Over the course of the summer, just as he had with French, he'd picked up a cassette language course from the library in preparation and entered his fourth year with a newfound sense of optimism. Unfortunately, his Spanish teacher was not as open-minded nor supportive as Madame Frost has been. In fact, Tom usually felt like the teacher disliked him and tried to undermine him in class. He used the same tricks with the Vicks and the earplugs he'd learned from Madame Frost, though. And whilst he didn't enjoy Spanish half as much, he managed to do well enough to avoid any unwanted troubles or attention. Outside of French and Spanish, he wasn't exactly an A student, but his reputation for being slow and difficult had faded. Even his parents commented that his mood and temper had eased as his confidence had grown. The better his performance at school, the less frequent his meltdowns had become. They couldn't remember the last time he'd sworn at them or thrown something. Maybe he was finally growing up. Lenny was still finding school difficult. When it came time to pick his options, he'd had little say in it. His father chose for him. The best jobs in the future would be in computers and technology, he said. So he pushed Lenny into science-based subjects and away from art and literature as Lenny would have chosen. He didn't have any trouble learning or understanding any of his subjects, but he just couldn't seem to please any of his teachers. He tried so hard to keep them happy, but he still got told to shut up in class and rarely got above a C grade in his written work. Each time he was given a new textbook, he would read through it in a weekend and could recite passages from memory by Monday, but it didn't help. Several teachers had started calling him Polly for parroting the text which just added another to the list of cruel or sarcastic nicknames he'd been saddled with. 
From the age of 14, Lenny became deeply reflective, or brooding, as his parents called it. The teachers bullied him, his fellow pupils mocked him from dawn to dusk, and his father was unrelentingly displeased. Even his mum, who had been an oasis of love and affection before, seemed to be keeping her distance, lavishing her attention on his little brother, who would soon be entering secondary school himself. As is the case in most boys-only schools, girls became the subject of myth and legend. Most of the pupils never mixed with anyone female that wasn't related to them, and their views on women were a confused mix of enthusiastic teenage hormones and old-fashioned misogyny inherited from their fathers. Adult magazines and VHS tapes would exchange hands with regularity, but Lenny wasn't interested. Maybe he was a slow developer, he thought, but he really wasn't thinking about girls in the way all his schoolmates were. That started the bullies on a whole new track. He wasn't part of the video and magazine circle. He didn't make up stories about the girls he scored with like most of them did. And he was well known for reading books in his breaks and for not being interested in sport. Now they sniggered behind his back and wrote homophobic slurs on his school books or ran away from him when he approached as if he could infect them. Were they right? Lenny wondered. Could he be gay? Maybe that was why he didn't fit in with anyone. Why he felt like a changeling, an enchanted being left in place of a real human baby at birth. The thought crossed his mind over and again, but he really wasn't sure. He wasn't obsessed with girls like most of the others, but he didn't feel anything about boys either. That preoccupation he'd been told is typical of lads his age seemed to have passed him by. He just wanted to be left alone. Tom's father had finally started to appreciate his son's newfound skills with languages. They'd been to the south of France and to Tenerife on holiday in the last couple of years, and having an interpreter of their own had been a godsend. Tom was an odd boy, but maybe he'd make something of himself after all. During the last summer break, Dad had taken him to work on site for a few weeks, teaching him the basics of his own trade as an electrician, and he'd taken to it really well earning himself extra pocket money in the process. When Tom told his dad he intended to stay on at school for sixth form though, maybe even go to university, it came as a bit of a shock. Dad had always assumed that he'd leave at 16 and start learning a trade, so he wasn't sure how he should feel. He'd even bought him a toolkit so he could follow in his footsteps. None of their family had ever been to university, which would make Tom the odd one out. They were a proud, working-class family, not intellectuals. Tom scraped through his GCSEs with sufficient grades to stay on at sixth form, so the toolkit would stay hidden under a blanket in the garage, waiting for a time it might be needed. If school didn't work out for him, he'd have it to fall back on. When Lenny was 15, one of the more popular boys at school had started talking to him. Trevor was one of the better players in the rugby team. A tall, handsome, muscular lad who was always popular with the other boys' sisters and mothers at school fates and sporting events. He professed to be a fan of the same nerdy stuff that Lenny enjoyed and wanted to get together after school. Trevor had a video collection he thought Lenny would like and nobody to share it with. Lenny wasn't used to boys being nice to him at school, especially not popular ones. He'd no real friends and was still being bullied. He'd been wary at first until one day Trevor stepped in and scared off a bunch of boys who'd been pelting him with the usual insults and jibes. Trevor's family were pretty well off compared to Lenny's. Their house was enormous, with a guest house at the bottom of the garden and large screen TVs and videos in every bedroom. Instead of the sci-fi posters and action figures Lenny expected to see in Trevor's room. The shelves were covered with trophies and the walls adorned with posters of footballers and rugby players. It didn't exactly shout sci-fi fan. Trevor explained. He'd always liked science fiction but his parents thought it was childish. Even talking about it would invite ridicule but he wanted to share it with Lenny as long as his dad didn't find out. 
What about those videos you told me about? Lenny asked. Oh yeah, you're going to love these, Trevor gushed as he delved into the back of his wardrobe and pulled out a shoebox stuffed with VHS tapes. They settled back on a couple of beanbags and Trevor hit play to watch what turned out to be one of Lenny's favourite episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation. Why have you got Star Trek videos hidden in your wardrobe? Lenny asked. Because Dad would kill me. I meant it when I said he was strict. If it's not about the real world, he says it's rubbish and a waste of time. So what does he watch on telly then? Sport, news, nature programmes, that's about it. He's away most of the time anyway. The boys watched TV and talked well into the night. They realised they had a lot more in common than they'd thought. It turned out that Trevor was no more interested in rugby than Lenny was, but he did it because it was expected of him. Trevor's life was ruled by his father even more than Lenny's was. A few weeks later, when they got together for what had become regular video nights, Trevor sat down a little closer to him. Lenny, you know the things they say about you in school? Are they true? Lenny frowned. Which things? I don't know what you mean. People say a lot of things about me. You know, that you don't like girls. Is it true? Well, kind of, Lenny answered. I don't think about girls like they do, but I don't know. Do you like me? Like that, I mean. Like the other boys talk about girls. No, I don't. Trevor looked at him for a long, awkward moment, then abruptly turned to the TV, shifted away from Lenny and pressed the play button. They sat in silence watching the next programme until Trevor announced that he had homework to do so Lenny would have to leave. Lenny was confused about what had happened, but he felt like he had learned something about himself. If he didn't think about Trevor that way, who was undoubtedly an attractive young man and a friend to boot, he probably wasn't gay. But what was he then? If Trevor was gay, what would that mean for their friendship? Come Monday, Trevor was waiting for Lenny just inside the school gates. They stood looking at each other for a moment in silence until Trevor spoke up. Are we still friends? If you want to be, Lenny replied. Friends don't rat on each other. You got me. I've got you, Lenny said, with an audible sigh of relief. If Lenny told the other boys about Trevor, it would destroy him. And he didn't want to do that to anyone. Why did anyone care if Trevor liked boys anyway? What did it matter to anyone else? He had a friend and protector. Someone he felt safe with. And he wasn't going to ruin it by exposing Trevor to the same misery he'd endured himself. For the next year, with Trevor at Lenny's side, most of the bullying tailed off. Whether it was fear at Trevor's formidable size or his popularity rubbing off on Lenny didn't matter. Life was a little easier now he had someone to talk to and watch his back. And so we leave our boys once more as adulthood beckons. Next time we catch up with them, they'll be 18 and facing the first challenges of adult life. But for now, thank you for watching. Don't forget that every time you like, subscribe, comment or share Autistomatic videos, you're helping more people learn about autistic life from an autistic creator. You make an even bigger difference when you support the channel on Patreon or make a purchase of exclusive designs from the Autistomatic Tee Public Shop. Links to both are in the description.